So today we're going to talk about the kinetic molecular theory of gases. So let's review a little bit first the difference between a law and a theory. So a law is a way of generalizing behavior that's been observed in many experiments. So you'd have to do a lot of experiment, experiments and get the same general result. And then we use this to predict behavior of similar systems. The only thing with a law is that it doesn't say why something happens. Okay, it just says this is what's going to happen, but it doesn't explain why. Well, a theory explains why. And so we can use a theory to build models. And a theory is successful if it explains the observed behavior and then correctly predicts future behavior. So it's kind of one step above a law. It predicts the behavior and also explains why. The only thing with a theory, though, is that it can never be proved to be absolutely true. Um, and so that's maybe one of the caveats. So let's talk about kinetic molecular theory, or KMT. So this is a theory that uses a model to explain the properties of an ideal gas, to explain why certain variables are affected the way that they are. So first, we're going to say that the volume of individual particles is negligible. And we talked about this when we talked about partial pressures. Second part of the theory is that the collision of particles with the walls of the container is what causes the pressure that's exerted by the gas. So the more collisions you have, the higher the pressure you have. And the third one is that particles exert no forces on each other. Remember, we're talking about an ideal gas here. Okay, so these are what we're saying are the, the rules for an ideal gas. So they may exert forces on the container, but not on each other. And the fourth part of the theory is that the average kinetic energy of gas particles is directly proportional to the Kelvin temperature. So directly proportional means a positive relationship. As we increase temperature, we increase the average kinetic energy, or vice versa. So let's look at some of those other variables in the ideal gas law and maybe explain why they occur the way that they do using kinetic molecular theory. Okay, so if we looked at Boyle's law, the rule was that if volume decreased, pressure would increase. But remember, a law doesn't explain why. So now let's use kinetic molecular theory to explain why. Well, if we decrease the volume, that means the particles are going to hit the wall more often. Well, since we said that hitting the wall was causing the pressure, if they're hitting the wall more often, then it's going to cause an increase in pressure. Let's look at the relationship between pressure and temperature. If temperature increases, pressure increases. That's the law. Okay, so here's why. If we increase temperature, remember we're increasing the average kinetic energy, so the particles are going to move faster. If we have a constant volume, since we're just changing pressure and temperature, then that means that because they're moving faster, they're going to hit the wall more often, which is going to be an increase in pressure. Okay, let's look at Charles' law, which is the relationship between volume and temperature. So the law was that if temperature increases, the volume will increase. Well, if we increase temperature, we know from kinetic molecular theory that that means that it's increasing the average kinetic energy, which means that the particles are moving faster. Well, the only way to keep pressure constant, then, is to increase the volume, because normally if those particles move faster, they're going to hit the wall more often. But if we want to keep pressure constant, we've got to increase that volume so they have more space to move around. Okay, let's look at Avogadro's law, which was the relationship between volume and the number of moles. So that if the number of moles increased, the volume increased. Okay, well, if we increase the quantity of particles, if we increase the number of moles, that means that we've got more particles hitting the wall, okay, which would be an increase in pressure. But if we want to keep the pressure constant, similar to what we just talked about, we've got to increase the volume in order to allow those particle, those, the larger quantity of particles to move around more. Okay, and then let's look at Dalton's law, which was our partial pressure. So kinetic molecular theory assumes that all gas particles are independent of each other. Remember, we said that they don't exert forces on each other. We also said that volumes and identities were unimportant. And so the total pressure is equal to sum of the pressure of all the individual gases, because if they're independent of each other, we can just add them together to get the total pressure. Okay, so now let's look at how we derive the ideal gas law based on all of those relationships. Okay, we know the ideal gas law is PV over N equals RT. Um, usually we talk about it as PV equals NRT, so this is just a different arrangement. If we use kinetic molecular theory and all those relationships that we just talked about, we come up with PV over N equals T. So the only difference here is the gas constant. Well, our links 
the relationships from kinetic molecular theory and the ideal gas law together. And so it was called a proportionality constant. It's a constant value, and we just use it in our calculations. Okay, so we talked a little bit about temperature and how it's related to the kinetic energy of particles. So Kelvin temperature indicates the average kinetic energy of the particles. So that's what temperature is. It's a, an indication of how fast the particles are moving. Well, the equation for average kinetic energy is 3 halves times R times T. So the higher the temperature you have, the faster your particles are going to move, the more kinetic energy they're going to have. Okay, we can translate this into root mean square velocity. So this is a small u. Let me get a pen here, maybe. So this is a small u and then root mean square. And root mean square, since it's a velocity, its units are meters per second. If we square that, so we've got root mean square velocity, that's the average of the squares of all the particle velocities. So root mean square velocity is the square root of 3 times the gas constant times temperature over what we're going to call n sub a times m. Now let's talk about that bottom term for a minute. n sub a is the number of particles in a mole, and m is the mass in kilograms. And so instead of multiplying, when we do multiply those together, instead of having to do them separately, we get um, a variable we're going to call capital M, which represents the mass of a mole of particles in kilograms. And so the units for that are going to be kilograms per mole. And we'll look at how to figure that out. And so if we take um, our capital M and substitute it in for n sub a times small m, we get that root mean square velocity is equal to the square root of 3RT over n. Now, because we're talking about velocity and we have kinetic energy involved, um, we need a new gas constant because the units of our other gas constant aren't going to work here. Okay, so if we convert that, we get a new gas constant of 8.314 joules per Kelvin mole. Okay, and so this gas constant fits with the units that we're given. So let's look at an example. So we want to calculate the root mean square velocity for the atoms in a sample of helium gas at 25 Celsius. Well, we know 25 Celsius is 298K. Okay, well, root mean square velocity is equal to the square root of 3RT over M. We know R is our gas constant. We know T. Now let's find M. Well, M is equal to the kilograms per mole. So I know that for helium, one mole is, if I look at my periodic table, 4.003 grams in one mole. Well, since capital M represents kilograms per mole, all I really need to do is convert this. So I know that there are 1,000 grams in one kilogram. And so I'm going to move my decimal three spots. So that gives me 0 0.004003 kilograms per mole. Now, if you had a compound instead of an element, it would be the same idea. You would just need to find the molar mass first and then convert your grams per mole to kilograms per mole. So now that I've got all of my variables, let's plug in. So we have 3 times 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. And my temperature is 298K. And I'm going to divide that by my capital M, which was 0 0.004003 kilograms per mole. Okay, so what I would do to calculate this is do all the numbers on the inside. So 3 times 8.314 times 298 divided by 0 0.004003. And then um, on some calculators, it's hard to do the square root once you've already got the answer. And so the um, other thing that you can do is, let's say that you know we solve all this and we get some value x. Well, you could go back and square root that. Or another way, instead of having to retype the number, depending on your calculator, is to take that value to the 1 half power. And so I just, once I have the number, I just hit the little caret key and then do parentheses with 1 half. And so taking something to the 1 half power is the same thing as square rooting. And so sometimes it makes it easier when you're calculating. OK, so once I've plugged all of this in, I get an answer of 1,362.6. Now, these are different units. So we kind of need to figure out where we're at here. So let's go up to the top so we have some room. So we know we've got joules, and then there's um, that k 
Kelvin that's being multiplied, so we'll put that on top. And then that's per mole Kelvin on the bottom. And then the bottom of our fraction has kilograms per mole. So I can multiply by the reciprocal on both sides to um, get that out of the bottom. So that cancels out everything in the bottom. So let's see, I've got Kelvin on top, Kelvin on the bottom, moles on top, moles on the bottom. So I'm left with joules per kilogram. And remember, this is being square rooted. Well, a joule is equal to a kilogram meter squared per second squared. And so that I can substitute in on the top. And then I'm going to divide that by kilogram over 1. Again, multiply by the reciprocal. So now my kilograms cancel. Remember, this is being square rooted. So because meters is squared and seconds is squared, when I square root it, I'm ending up with meters per second. So there, you kind of know where the units are coming from instead of just randomly plugging in. Uh, for significant figures, it looks like I have two, so my final answer is 1,400 meters per second. Okay, so let's talk about a little bit more about the velocity. So the mean free path is the average distance a particle travels between collisions. So it's going to collide, it's going to shoot it off this way, it's going to travel a little bit, and then collide again. And so that path that it travels, that distance, is the mean free path. Even though we calculated the root mean square velocity, so it's the average, majority of gas particles don't have this average velocity, and that's just because there's all these collisions going on, and they're traveling different distances, and you know it can change a lot. And as the temperature increases, the average velocity and the spread of velocities will also increase. So um, a lot of them aren't going to have this root mean square velocity. So let's look at an example of this. Um, so here we've got particle speed and the fraction of particles at that speed. So you can see there's two different lines here. This one is the root mean square speed, and then this front line is the average or the mean speed. So they don't exactly line up all the time. And you can see that we've got a wider distribution um, of speeds also.